Welcome everybody to the B word. I'm Steve Lee, the lead of Square Crypto, and I'm here today to moderate a discussion about Bitcoin that will span from what makes it special to the um, its relationship with energy, it the community ethos, and the future of Bitcoin. I'm joined by three special guests. The first is Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, and CIO of Ark Invest. Next is Elon Musk, techno king of Tesla and chief engineer of SpaceX. <laughs> and finally, uh, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square and CEO of Twitter. So we have a lot to talk about today. So let's get to the talk and get right to it. Um, I'm going to start off by asking each of you uh, a question, uh, which is what um, what's shaped and influenced your views on Bitcoin? And let's start with Kathy. Okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, well, the first thing was uh, our focus on disruptive innovation. Uh, so starting in 2011, Brett Winton, our director of research, who I know will be on the program later, um, he started talking about this thing called crypto, well, Bitcoin at the time. And it was a curiosity as we were doing our brainstorms in, in research. But as we learned more about this open source ecosystem, uh, that might fulfill the role of the, the payment system that the internet neglected to build into the system, not expecting commerce, we thought, hmm, this might be something. And then I became even more interested when I realized uh, that, there, that, that my economics would come into play as well here. And uh, Art Laffer, um, my mentor uh, from, from USC, uh, and a monetary scholar, uh, in 2014, I asked him if he would collaborate on a paper on on Bitcoin. Uh, and he he was a bit of a naysayer at first, and uh, but agreed to read the paper. He read the paper, tore it up, uh, and 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 from an economics point of view, really wanted to understand this. And he said, "You know, I think you got something here. This is a rules based monetary system." I've been waiting for this for my entire career. So the combination of disruptive innovation generally, economics on top of that, and the huge misunderstanding out there as to what this is, uh, that was that was intriguing and, and launched our research effort. Thank you. Elon, uh, what's influenced your views on Bitcoin? Well, I've thought about money for quite a while, obviously since the PayPal days. Um, the uh, uh, and then the, the companies that preceded that X.com, which I created, and and uh, Confinity, which uh, Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, uh, Luke Howery, and others created. Um, and we combined the companies and made PayPal. Made PayPal. So I've been thinking about money for a long time. Um, and re really, it's it, it's, like it's best to think of money as an information system, uh, primarily an information system for labor allocation, um, and. Uh, for practical purposes, it exists in a series of uh, heterogeneous databases, like very different databases in uh, bank mainframes around the world. Uh, it uh, moves quite slowly in reality. It may seem to move fast sometimes, and it does with PayPal, which is real time. But uh, the vast majority of the systems out there are batch processing. So the actual uh, reconciliation may take uh, one to five uh, business days, uh, so sometimes longer. Um, and the, the, you have the ACH system, which is ancient and still still in operation, which is um, allows transfers uh, effectively like a, a check would be an ACH tra transfer, but it's it's not secure. And you've got the uh, credit card systems, which are also uh, not secure. It would be like handing your username and password to a stranger in a restaurant if, if you buy a meal. So um, there's, there's definitely an opportunity for... Uh, something that is uh, that is better from an inf information theory standpoint. So, um, and, and 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 there you can think of it like data data on a network. I think is, is the way to view it. Um, what has the the most throughput? What has uh, the the least error? Uh, lost? What what drops the fewest packets? Uh, fraud, fraud, for example, being a source of error, um, and uh, uh, government interference in currencies being a source of error. Um, but it's it's fundamentally an information system. So. Um, I think it makes sense to support something that uh, improves the, the 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 quality of information with which we conduct the economy, um, and you know, Bitcoin is uh, a candidate for that. Uh, it is it does I think some things 
Well, um, and it's obviously, it's, it's evolving and there are additional things like lightning being done on top of Bitcoin. Um, but, but Bitcoin per se is mostly solving for uh, scarcity um, or, or rather solving for uh, essentially um, having no throat to choke, decentralized. Uh, so there's, there's no one who can be uh, coerced in any way uh, to uh, empty their Bitcoin account. Well, I guess they could technically buy on an individual basis, but the system as a whole cannot. Um, and, um, and it has an open ledger, uh, which is also quite, quite good. Um, but transaction volume is, is low, uh, transaction, transaction cost is high, uh, and usability for the average person is, is, not, is not yet very good. But it has a lot of potential. Um, and I should say that, like, I, I'm not, and I apologize for taking a long time, but there's, there certainly is lots to say. Um, in general, I'm a supporter of, of Bitcoin um, and uh, the idea of cryptocurrency in general. Um, uh, but as I've said publicly, we, we do need to watch, to watch out for uh, crypto taking, uh, especially Bitcoin, using proof of work to maybe use energy that's maybe a bit too much uh, and, and not necessarily uh, good for the environment. So, um, but on balance, I support Bitcoin and, I, I, and I, I'm not an investor. I don't, the only publicly traded stock I own is Tesla. Um, and the only significant thing I own outside of Tesla is, is, is my SpaceX stock that, that, that um, you know, could help create both companies. So, um, but, out, but apart from that, uh, I do own Bitcoin uh, and, and Tesla owns, owns Bitcoin, SpaceX owns Bitcoin. Um, and I do personally uh, own a bit of Ethereum and, and Dogecoin, of course. So. Okay, great. Thank you. And we'll get into some of those issues in, in, in more depth as well. Um, Jack, how about you? What shaped your views of Bitcoin? Um, the, the network and the community. I, you know, it's, uh, it's deeply principled. It's weird as hell. Uh, it's always evolving. And it just reminded me of the internet when I was a kid. And, you know, I, I encountered alt cypherpunks when I was fairly young. And um, this was a topic of discussion for years. I didn't touch it until 2008 when we started Square. Um, you know, we, Elon and teams at X and PayPal inspired a lot of what we were trying to do, trying to bring in more to a physical world. But we encountered this crazy predatory system um, that was slow, that was obtuse, and I think you know, one of the things that we tried to do, which X and PayPal also tried to do, is build an abstraction layer around this complication and around this predatory nature that the financial industry can tend to be and make it work for people. But when I saw Bitcoin in 2009, you see a chance to replace the whole foundation and everything that Elon was talking about in terms of ACH and um, the credit card networks we're built with very different agendas in a very different time frame, and it's crazy that they still exist and yeah. they have scaled, but they, they they just are not relevant to today, and they're certainly not relevant to the future, especially when you consider the entire world and countries like Nigeria or Ghana or India and its interconnection with countries like the United States and Canada and all over Europe. So what what really drove my thinking and drives my passion around it is like if the internet gets a chance to get a native currency um what will that be and and to me it's bitcoin because of those principles because of that creation story because of its resilience uh, because of the number of tests it's been but what what inspires me the most is just community driving it it's it just reminds me of the early internet it's it's the only reason that i have a career because i learned so much from people like who are building Bitcoin today. And I continue to learn uh, in that sense. And um, I'm so grateful for it. So that's a good segue into the next question I'd like to ask you, Jack, is you, you said before the Bitcoin changes everything. Can you speak more to that? Well, I just I, I just think that, um, you know, our a lot of what we experience in life, um, when you really get down to the to the foundation, a lot of our monetary policies, a lot of our monetary systems cause so much distraction and so much cost. 
And when you get to a system where you have the potential for people to truly own it, um, they can verify it themselves. You don't have to have trust going in. Uh, you don't have to trust it at all. You can verify it uh, through source code or whatever your, um, your appetite is. And that any particular person can help drive uh, the future of it. And at the same time, it's not controlled by any state. It's not controlled by any bank. It's not controlled by any corporation. Um, and these three parties of people who participate in the network, people who mine, and also the developers constantly debating uh, the correct roadmap and the way forward is a beautiful thing. And I don't know of many other consensus-based models that have existed at that scale for this long with this amount of success, and we're still fairly early. So when, you know, I, I met a woman in Ethiopia uh, two years ago, and she was trying to create the lift for, for Ethiopia. Elon, I think I reached out to you at that time as well because she really wanted some Teslas. Um, she still has to take paper fiat cash from her passengers and pay all of her drivers in the same way because there's no monetary system that she can utilize. There's nothing digital. Um, and Africa as a continent is hugely interconnected from a monetary standpoint, but also hugely taxed in that same way. Um, so a lot of the potential that I, I see, you know, the internet having a, a native currency um, helps her build her business uh, in a much faster way. And also if you consider something like Bitcoin existing before um, YouTube, before Twitter, before Facebook, a lot of the business models that we have today would not be the same. We would not, we would certainly not have the dependency we have upon the advertising business model if Bitcoin existed pre-Twitter. And I think the amount of um, business models that it enables, the amount of innovation it enables going forward, especially when you can consider the whole internet instead of going country by country by country by country, which you have to whenever you're doing with finance, um, it, it really just opens the aperture. And that that is that is what I want to see in my lifetime, is, is a currency that is standard and sound for the internet that everyone can use. Great. Um, a hallmark of Bitcoin is its fixed supply of 21 million coins. Um, Elon referenced that earlier. It may be the first system that humans have created that humans cannot later change. Kathy, I'm curious, with your background in monetary history and macroeconomics, what, what are your thoughts on that? That type of system. Oh well, I'll just uh, I'll recount the 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 story uh, about Art Laffer and and our going through the paper, uh, and he said, uh, as I said, first rules based monetary system, global ever. This is a a very big idea. Once we had convinced him of the um, of the ecosystem it, itself. Uh, now, this is uh, the role that it's playing, given that the rule is a quantity rule, that 21 million units, is really a, a store of value uh, role. So there are three roles of money, uh, store of value, very important, uh, 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 the uh, means of exchange, so for transactions, and the unit of account, uh, so uh, every good priced in terms of, uh, of whatever the unit is. Uh, so store of value is um, its primary use right now. Um, the others uh, exist with unit of account, reserve currency of the crypto asset ecosystem. That's being seeded a little bit towards uh, uh, stable coins right now. Uh, but the store of value is a, a, a very big role and means of exchange with apps built on top of uh, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, we think is going to become more, more of a reality. Right now, high value, uh, high value transactions take place over, over Bitcoin, uh, and, uh, and that is a very useful role. So we look at those, and I remember saying to Art, how big could this be? And he said, well, how big is the US monetary base? Well, today it's $8 trillion, $8 trillion. At the time we were talking, it was $4 trillion. Uh, so we've gone through another crisis since then. Um, 
And so the store of value, this idea that purchasing power will go up over time uh, uh, if demand rises relative to supply, supply ultimately fixed at 21 million units. Um, that's, that's a very good thing, purchasing power going up globally around the world. Uh, and this idea that it's a hedge against uh, confiscation of wealth, uh, and that can take place in, in a myriad uh, uh, of ways, uh, but uh, inflation, and especially hyperinflation in emerging markets, is the primary way. Talk about uh, dis destroying purchasing power. Uh, so that's a very big, uh, very big idea. And I'll also mention uh, deflation. In some ways, it's a hedge against deflation. I know some people are confused that um, we uh, at ARC think that we're in a deflationary environment here in the United States. If that is true, the odds of a hyperinflation in the rest of the world, especially in emerging markets, uh, is also true. So, but this deflation, and we learned from 0809, there's counterparty risk associated with deflation. And I think Bitcoin uh, would be a hedge against that uh, uh, eventuality as well. So it's a very big idea. Right. I suspect among us, there's not a lot of debate about Bitcoin's potential as a store of value. But Jack, you referenced earlier um, it being or, or becoming the native currency of the Internet. Can you speak more to that and, and also how it relates to maybe how uh, institutions think about it? Um, yeah, I mean, like um, just, just simple example, if uh, I happen to be in Ghana and my family is in Nigeria, uh, currently I can take anywhere from a uh, and I need to send money back I, anywhere from uh, 10 to 30 percent off the top just to send that money back. Whereas um, if you just focus on the worldwide remittance problem, um, Bitcoin solves so many, so many of those problems today instantly uh, without having to go through any intermediaries or any slowness or complicated systems that a corporation or, or a state uh, created. So I think, um, you know, having having sound money with that is separate from the state is the idea uh, having it completely verifiable by everyone including the state including corporations including individuals including developers who want to build on top of it is quite powerful and that's what keeps it secure and strong and um i think that's you know we we need we need more of that which is why this one of the one of the reasons why this conversation is so important is as entities come into the space um it's not just buying an asset and holding on to an asset and treating it as an investment there's something special that created this and something precious and something very unique, um, which has to be protected. And, and we need to do whatever we can to, to help that thrive as well. Elon, I'm curious your opinion on this. You, you mentioned earlier uh, about Bitcoin's throughput or the, the importance of throughput, um, maybe some concerns around Bitcoin. Uh, can you speak? Do you, th do you think Bitcoin can become peer to peer cash? Um, well, Bitcoin does have a fundamentally a fundamental scarcity limit at the base layer uh, that's designed in. Um, that doesn't mean you can't have some layer two system in theory like Lightning. Um, and I understand Lightning is doing well in in, in some small countries. Um, there's there's some question mark as to whether you need um, a money transmitter license. Um, just a debate as to whether that's needed, um, given that it is not uh, open ledger. Um, so it's, there's, and that's, that's a whole separate debate, of course. Um, but Bitcoin, but Bitcoin by itself simply cannot scale to be the monetary system for the world at base layer, but with a second layer, this is possible depending upon how that, that second layer is implemented. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's part of why I think there's, there's, there may be some merit, um, to, uh, <laughs> something that. May seem silly, like like Ethereum, like like Dogecoin. Um, I, I think Ethereum also, might, like I said, might, like the three the three things I, I own outside of SpaceX and Tesla, uh, and also obviously it's a Neuralink and Boring Company, but but of any significance are um, Bitcoin by far, and then so, some Ethereum and some Doge. Um, so you know, if, if if the price of Bitcoin goes down, I I uh, I lose money. I, I'm not sort of, you know. Um, you know, I might pump, but I don't dump. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
you know, it, it's not a case of, um, I'm, I definitely do not believe in, <laughs> in getting the price high and selling or anything like that. Um, so, uh, and I would like to see Bitcoin succeed. Um, uh, I think there's, there's some merit to, cons this is not a slam on Bitcoin, there's some merit to, to consider considering uh, uh, something that has a higher max transaction rate um, and a lower transaction cost um, and kind of seeing how far you could take a single layer network where the uh, exchanges act as a de facto uh, second layer. Um, I think you can probably take that further than people realize and, and as uh, bandwidth increases over time, uh, latency decreases. Uh, I mean, uh, SpaceX's Starlink is actually playing a role in this, um, and I think long term people will probably have, you know, access to uh, worldwide access to gigabit level uh, connectivity at low latency, and so uh, at, at, at low cost. And so then, you know, your, your your base layer could do a lot of transactions if you uh, take that into account. Um, so. Yeah, but, but like I said, Bitcoin with a layer two system um, certainly could scale to do a vast number of transactions. Uh, same goes for Ethereum. Question about the um, <clears throat> scaling at the layer one. The, the concern from you know the past five years of debate in the Bitcoin community is that that would sacrifice too much uh, decentralization and hurt the censorship resistant properties of Bitcoin. Um, I'm curious, if, if you know, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are you sensitive to that? Do you, and are you concerned about losing some of the special properties of Bitcoin or, or, or another cryptocurrency by scaling at layer one? Yeah, I mean, th these things are it's helpful to like use the physics tools of thinking and say, you know, scale up, scale down and see if it still makes sense. So if scaling up the transaction block doesn't make sense, why don't you scale it down? And have it be, you know, so that somebody, you know, with a laptop from 2008 can still run a Bitcoin node. Why don't you slow it down? Oh, you want to slow it down? Well, maybe you have, maybe you're at the wrong number then. <laughs> there's, there's actually people, there are members in the community that do do want to slow it down. <laughs> but I, but I no, understand. No, it's, it's silly. Um, the 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 reality is like the average person is not going to run um, a Bitcoin node. So. This is this is a and 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 Bitcoin, you know, uh, it was a lot of clever ideas, but uh, you know, th th these parameters were set. I don't know what in two thousand eight or something, uh, maybe two thousand nine. Um, and there's like there've been some improvements uh, since then, but but not a lot. So, um, you know, it's sort of like if, if, if the, the there was still in two thousand eight there was still a, a non-trivial number of people on modems, <laughs> so. Um, you know, now now it is it is uh, quite common to get a uh, uh, hundred megabit uh, connection just for a house. Some some houses have gigabit connections. So, um, and th that trend is obviously in the direction of higher bandwidth and lower latency. Um, and if somebody else doesn't do it, Starlink certainly will. So, I have high confidence that uh, you will be able to maintain a decentralized finance system while still having a much bigger blockchain, aka te ASCII text text ledger, um, <laughs> a hash ledger. Um, you can make the hash ledger bigger um, without uh, suffering from decentralization as uh, the average connectivity improves. Obviously, one idea would be to run a, or to put a Bitcoin full node in in Starlink ter terminals. That way, more people would be be running. I uh, actually, <laughs> I have run this by the team at one point. Um, I had this idea, which is kind of off the wall, but uh, like, let's say you need a, a, a little space heater. Um, and normally your space heater would uh, just be pure entropy. Um, but what if that space heater was also a, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Doge mining node? Uh, pick, pick your currency. Um, and so then you'd be heated up and uh, you would also mind it, uh, uh, you know, your your crypto, uh, and have connectivity in one. I love that idea. Yeah, I mean, better than running a space heater. Absolutely. Are, are there any other um, 
you know, so you're, you're drawn to, to Dogecoin a little bit. Are there any other gaps in Bitcoin that you see that cause you to, to be drawn to, towards Dogecoin? Oh, I think, um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think there's, there's, um, there's, Doge has, uh, the Doge community, I think, has, uh, is somewhat irreverent, obviously, and uh, is, uh, has great memes and loves dogs, and I, I love dogs and memes. And um, uh, it, it doesn't take itself too seriously. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, you know, there's, 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 uh, there's Occam's razor, which is the, the 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 simplest answer is the most likely. Uh, it's a summary of Occam's razor. The simplest answer is the most likely one. Then there's a friend of mine came up with a variant on that that the most ironic outcome is the most likely one. Um, and then I have a variant on that which is the most entertaining outcome is the most likely one. So if that is true, then the most ironic and entertaining outcome would be that the, the cryptocurrency that was started as a joke. <laughs> to make fun of cryptocurrencies ends up being the lead the leading cryptocurrency <laughs> that would be the most ironic outcome yeah. jack what, what are your thoughts on that <laughs> um, is, is bitcoin resilient enough to uh, overcome that i think it's resilient but also i think like it, you you find i mean that's what attracts me to the to bitcoin in the first place is the irreverence um a lot of that uh, a lot of that uh a lot of that just brings it forward and 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 you know at first go it, it it makes it a little bit inaccessible but as people get into it it makes it more accessible and more spreadable and um i i think i i absolutely think the resilience is there um i i think it's important to have fun as well and anyway anyway folks can express themselves i think that goes back to the main idea of like how do we how do we create a, a native currency for the internet any anything that goes towards that path like that's whatever whatever wackiness or fun we can have along the way. That's going to make it a lot more enjoyable, and it's going to make a lot more people want to use it. I'd also point out there's nothing stopping someone from creating a Bitcoin wallet that has that's like fun and has memes, has dogs. That's possible as well. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, great. Let's move on. To the... Right now, at this point, <laughs> um, let's move on to the next topic, which is Bitcoin and energy. It's a really hot topic um, that lots of people are talking about. Um, let's start with uh, Elon. You've been vocal on this. You've uh, you've said that. I mean, you said many things about it. Um, you've also said that uh, Tesla will resume payments in Bitcoin payments if the renewable energy is approximately fifty percent and and sort of looks like it's on a positive future yes. trend. Um, what do you think the state of things are with respect to that? Yeah, so I, I do think that um, it, it, there, there appears to be a positive trend um, in the energy usage of Bitcoin. Uh, actually, part of this is due to the drop in Bitcoin price. Um, so um, I mean, what, what I observed or what I thought I was seeing, um, there may be some disagreements on this, but uh, from when uh, Tesla announced that it had acquired Bitcoin and was doing Bitcoin transactions, there, there was a massive run up in the Bitcoin price. Um, and also a massive increase in the amount of energy used to mine Bitcoin. Um, and I think the, you know, I, I, I understand renewable energy quite a bit. I mean, te te Tesla does solar and is uh, interacts with uh, a lot of uh, wind generation uh, through our mega pack because, you know, basically need to store energy from wind and from solar. So we're pl pretty plugged into the renewable in energy industry. Um, and there's, there's just no way that you could basically double or triple the amount of energy in such a short period of time with renewables. Um, but you could shovel coal that fast. And so I was like, look, this is this is too sketchy. Tesla's mission is accelerating uh, the advent of sustainable energy. Um, we, we can't be the company that does that and also um, not do appropriate diligence on the energy usage of Bitcoin. So, um, so all I did was I said, look, we're, we're going to suspend Bitcoin transactions for now. We're not selling any Bitcoin, nor am I selling anything personally, or nor is SpaceX selling any Bitcoin. Um, again, I want to emphasize uh, SpaceX, Tesla, and, and I own Bitcoin. Uh, uh, I, I also own a little bit of Ethereum and Doge, but the companies just own Bitcoin. Um, and the Bitcoin that I own is worth uh, much more than the Ethereum or Doge. So uh, clearly, if I'm... Uh, 
you know, if the, the, these actions negatively affect me financially, if I was purely financially motivated, then uh, I would I would not uh, express this reticence about uh, Bitcoin energy usage. Um, now, the it, it looks like Bitcoin is shifting a lot more towards renewables, um, and a bunch of the um, heavy-duty coal plants that were being used, unequivocally being used, this is not a question mark, um, have been shut down, especially in, in China. So uh, I think it's probably, uh, I, I want to do a little bit more diligence um, to confirm uh, that the could, could confirm that the percentage of renewable energy usage is most likely uh, or, uh, sort of at or above fifty percent, um, and that there is that that, that there is a trend towards imp- increasing that number, um, and if so, then Tesla will resume Bitcoin uh, accepting Bitcoin. Uh, yeah, so I think we want to just do a little bit more diligence, and and I think, but most likely the answer is that Tesla would would resume accepting Bitcoin, most, most likely. That's Steve, good to hear. I would Steve, agree with that. Kathy? Yeah, may I ask a question? Um, Elon, I'm not quite sure if you saw the paper uh, that Square and ARC did together on um, making uh, Bitcoin mining a part of a utility, uh, you know, a broad-based utility ecosystem, whereby, you know, the overage from sunshine or wind uh, uh, powers the Bitcoin mining machine, thereby uh, enabling uh, the proliferation of renewables uh, to a much faster extent or at a faster rate than otherwise would be the case. What do you think of that? Well, the problem is that um, in order to operate um, so-called mining or hashing rigs, uh, in order to operate a bunch of hashing rigs, uh, uh, effectively, you have to run them 24-7. Um, which means you need base load. Uh, you can do that with uh, solar and wind plus battery, but if you only did it based on solar wind overage, uh, your, um, your your hashing regularization would be much less. So you'd be at a disadvantage. Sure. Uh, it'd be a disadvantage. Hydro, or geothermal, hydro or geothermal are great for mm-hmm. as renewable means. I'm also uh, pro, pro-nuclear. Uh, I think modern nuclear power plants are safe, uh, contrary to what people may think. Um, so, um, I really think we, you know, we, um, it's, it's possible to make in, in, very, very extremely safe <laughs> nuclear. I mean, talking about fission, you don't need fusion. <laughs> um, and then, of course, fusion—you just got that big fusion reactor in the sky called the sun. It comes up every, you know, every day. Um, so. Uh, but I think a combination of solar and wind plus uh, stationary storage uh, will get you that uh, uh, base load so you can run uh, uh, hashing 24-7. I'm, Jack, I'm curious. You, you've stated that Bitcoin incentivizes renewable energy. Uh, that's what we're talking about now. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, every everything that uh, that Elon said and Kathy, Kathy mentioned, but... Um, it, it's also incentivizing a lot of innovation in, in just energy space and just like looking at unused energy. Um, there's a there's a company called uh, Great American Mining that um, caps the methane flares on oil oil fields to power their their rigs. And you just imagine and, and you mentioned nuclear Elon as well. And just imagine all the unused energy that is just being wasted every single day, um, and being able to get that energy and convert it converting it into a secure, sound money system for the planet um, feels like a worthy trade-off. And, and that's the sort of incentive that I think is, is most powerful is like, how do we reuse what is being currently just dumped on the ground and wasted and, and not considered? And how do we do that at scale? Um, and I think that's a, that's a bigger conversation that I think is, is missing. Um, but I agree with, with everything that, that Elon has said and also um, you know, the paper we put forth. I, I'm i curious if any of you have thoughts on how the industry, could, what the industry can do to accelerate this the transition to renewable energy. And like Elon specifically, could Tesla Energy or Starlink play a role? Well, um, I think Tesla can play a role. Or t- I mean, Tesla's... Um, uh, literal like reason for existence. Um, I mean, the reason I've I've 
I put so much of my life energy into Tesla, which is a lot. Um, in fact, it's, I would say that I've had some, some, some pretty tough life experiences and Tesla is responsible for probably two thirds of all, prof, all personal and professional pain combined, just to give you a, a sense of perspective there. Um, so this is a hella hard situation. Um, but we, we, we do solar, uh, commercial solar, um, solar retrofit as well as the solar, um, roof. Um, and we make, uh, consumer, um, battery packs called Powerwall for houses and small businesses. And then the utility scale, uh, which, which are gigantic. These we, we've done now, uh, a number of, of gigawatt hour installations. Like it, that's a lot, that's a lot. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of them actually have been for load leveling the grid. But mostly they are, um, and, and combined with like big, so like the one, the first really big one we did, which is, um, a hundred megawatt installation in, um, in Australia, uh, uh, that's actually helped stabilize a huge portion of the South Australian grid um, because it's able to react so fast. Um, in fact, at first, um, <laughs> they've, they've got the, a billing system in, in Australia that I think works at the sort of millisecond level, and we were operating at the microsecond level. <laughs> so it was, it was the system was operating so fast that, that the measuring system couldn't see it. But um, so, so Tesla certainly doing doing a lot to. Um, uh, enable renewables, uh, especially wind and solar. Um, uh, and in fact, the limiting factor for us right now is cell production. So we, we need to um, both internally uh, get our, the Tesla internal, internal battery cells produced as well as uh, increase supply from suppliers. Um, and generally when I talk to our suppliers and they say, what, what, how many cells would you like us? So how many cells can you make? Um, you know, because sometimes they're like, concerned like was Tesla going to compete with them on sales I'm like no no if you want to make the sales be our guest it's just that we, we need a crazy number of, of batteries um, and they need to be done it obviously needs to be mined and produced and um, manufactured um, in an ethical and environmentally sound way so um, you know at Tesla we, we really do aspire to be the good guys like you know to be, to be a company that, that people can, can believe in that doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but that's what we try. So, um, yeah, but I think generally um, hydro, especially existing hydro, is is good for uh, mining. Uh, geothermal, and there's lots of places in the world that have geothermal energy. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, nuclear is also good. Um, so, um, yeah, I think just, 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 I'm like, I'm, I'm, and I'm like, as I said earlier, I'm like, <laughs> the expectation is not like that the, the the energy production must be pure as the driven snow, but it it, it must uh, it, it can't be using it also cannot be using the, the world's dirtiest coal, which it was for a moment there. Um, so um, <clears throat> you know that's that's just difficult to for Tesla to support in that situation. So I, I think. Um, and I, but I do think long-term renewable energy will actually be the cheapest form of energy. It just takes; it just doesn't happen overnight. Um, but as long as that there, as long as there is a, a conscious and, and, and determined and real effort by the mining community to move towards renewables, then obviously Tesla can support that. That's great, um, Kathy. We've been talking a lot about energy, but many institutions are facing questions around Bitcoin's relationship with ESG. Um, can you maybe speak a little bit more to what, what is S and G in ESG and, and how Bitcoin might support those? Sure. So E, of course, is environmental, S is social, and G is governance. Uh, and there is a massive movement uh, afoot in the institutional world, especially, uh, to embrace uh, ESG and, and make sure that their asset managers are, are doing the same. Uh, so if if you th we've just talked about environmental, and I, I really do believe uh, that Bitcoin will be uh, much more environmentally friendly, certainly than traditional gold mining or the traditional financial services sector. In many ways, it already is, uh, and it's just going to uh, get better that way. In terms of social, I know that... Um, Many institutions, when they are thinking of social, they think of diversity and equity, pay equity, and all of that. Uh, but uh, if, if uh, 
from our point of view, the disruptive innovation point of view, social is uh, much more than that. Uh, it is saving lives, of course, autonomous technology, that would be another topic uh, for, for Elon. Uh, but in this case, uh, allowing ac access to payment technology, as Jack is, is saying, everywhere around the world without friction, if you, and just back to the remittance, um, example i think uh if if i've got these stats correctly you know there are certain countries in the world that are dependent incredibly dependent on remittances for you know gdp uh to uh, tonga 37 percent el salvador which just deemed uh bitcoin legal currencies 24 percent nepal 24 percent and i think the remittance industry globally <clears throat> it, I, or roughly 700 billion. Uh, so uh, saving people these uh, egregious fees, you know, think about it, you're paying anywhere from 8% to, to, as Jack said, 30% of your $100 that you're sending back to your family. Uh, that is a social responsibility, I, I would submit, as is just the uh, economic empowerment that Bitcoin will enable. We've talked about that already. Uh, and I know that uh, Alex Bladstein is going to be talking later about, um, you know, the 4.3 billion people in the world who are hostage to authoritarian regimes or the 1.3 billion who are living in uh, uh, double digit and, and triple digit inflation, if not more. Um, saving them from the destruction of their purchasing power certainly is a, a noble social goal. So we expand social to be m much more than uh, the traditional ESG community. And then on governance, you've got uh, the transparency of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, it's completely transparent, unlike uh, the opaqueness of financial systems and the toll takers in uh, the traditional financial world. And I think a huge part, a part of governance in the Bitcoin ecosystem is the are the uh, Bitcoin core developers. Now, uh, before I met them, and I've had the pleasure and the honor of of meeting uh, uh, many of them. Uh, you know that was that was a part of this ecosystem I didn't understand. But actually, getting to sit down and talk to them, uh, I uh, if I if I uh, have a learning curve need, it certainly is on the technology side. But in, in terms of talking to them about economics, economic theory, failed monetary regimes uh, historically, they know economic history, many of them, better than anyone I've ever met. Uh, so that gives me a great degree of confidence that, uh, you know, they, they do believe they, they are on a noble mission. They could be paid a lot more than they're being paid right now if they worked at Google or or Facebook or, or some of these other areas, but they've chosen, uh, you know, um, this sense of purpose for a noble goal. And uh, they have incredibly strong technology backgrounds. Uh, so uh, a, a, as well as a good understanding of economic history, especially monetary uh, history. Uh, and it gives me a, a great deal of comfort as I think about the governance of the ecosystem. Uh, much, much more so than I, I think we would find in other financial ecosystems. Uh, and just to give you an example of that, I think two years we were talking about that. Apparently, I mean, not apparently. Uh, there's a big debate about reorganizations. I know in the Ethereum network right now. Well, we uh, saw the the core Bitcoin developers and others at work uh, back in 2019 when Binance tried to reorganize. Uh, in order to uh, reclaim 7,000 uh, Bitcoin that were hacked. And they just wouldn't allow it. So we've already had some very good tests of the Bitcoin ecosystem, including developers. Uh, so that would great. be my answer. See. Thank, thank you. Uh, and it's a great transition to the next topic area, which is Bitcoin ethos. And what is Bitcoin ethos? I mean, Bitcoin was born as open source and it's very transparent. Um, there's also a, a staunch defense from the community around decentralization and a lot of the core principles of Bitcoin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that and what makes it special. Jack, um, Square has done a lot to support open source Bitcoin. 
Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what Square has done and what advice you'd have for other institutions looking to follow in its footsteps? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was very skeptical of corporations when I was a kid, and I'm still skeptical of corporations today. And, you know, as we've used corporations to be, you know, they, they've been great, great vessels for what we need to do and the ideas that we need to bring to the world. But, um, you know, Bitcoin is not that. And um, when we were considering Bitcoin and how Square intersected, I was really concerned with um, how we don't disrupt the community in a negative way, how we promote what is amazing about it and how we help it grow in that way, in the way that it wants to. So we created your team, Steve, which is Square Crypto, which is hiring open source developers to work on whatever they want and whatever they think is most important to, to help Bitcoin. Um, we created an organization called Copo, which we gave up all of our crypto patents um, so that the community can use them uh, in defense against uh, trolls and um, some, uh, some, some crazy characters we won't name. And um, we continue to find ways that like, following that Bitcoin path, we're, we're going to create a hardware wallet. We're probably going to do a lot more in hardware. Um, everything that we do in the space is going to be completely open source from the hardware design um, to the, the software, um, taking in the community's uh, push. And we're, we're building a, a developer platform as well in the same open development, open source, um, and uh, uh, completely transparent. So I think as institutions or companies like ours consider getting in the space, um, I think contribution back to the community is important. Tessa did this um, with uh, accepting payments for Tessa and finding security holes and uh, improving the stack. And uh, as I said before, we can't just see this as an asset that we own and, and an investment vehicle. Um, this is something that has the potential to change everything and make the lives of everyone on this planet better in some small, maybe marginal way, but um, th those, margin those margins will be meaningful as they compound over time. Great. Uh, Elon, you've tweeted before that any wallet that doesn't give the user their private key should be avoided at all costs. Um, yeah. Can you tell us more about what, why is that important, and and you know how does it, what's its relationship with decentralization? Well, <clears throat> it's difficult to say that if if you uh, own crypto in an exchange and the exchange does not give you private keys, it's not clear that you own anything. I mean, if 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 there's something. That, if that exchange breaks or is hacked or, uh, you know, um, or, or is subject to seizure by the government or something like that, uh, you, you don't, you, your crypto is gone. Um, so in order to actually have a properly decentralized finance, you, uh, which I'm a fan of, um, I think it makes sense, uh, then you, you, you have to own your, your private keys. Um, and you should be the only one who has your private keys. <laughs> so if you're the only one who has the private keys, then then you own it. <laughs> um, if you if someone else has your private keys, effectively they own it too. Um, and your your the security of your crypto is then dependent upon them or any entity that can affect uh, them. So uh, yeah, um, I I think what Jack's doing so sounds like a good idea to have um, you know a hardware wallet that. Uh, that's the, that's the only thing that contains your private keys. Um, I think that, that's in, in, in terms of sort of empowering the people, which I very much, very much believe in. Then I, I think you want to have people have the, the their own wallets and uh, and be the only ones that that, uh, that have the private keys to that that wallet, so so called wallet, <laughs> the other side of the <laughs> of the crypto. Right. <laughs> I, I agree, think and I think. <laughs> I think we'll see an emergence too of new solutions that um, use multi-sig, uh, like like with a two of three keys, where the the user has two keys and then you you get assisted custody by having an institution hold hold a third key can be a good good solution as well. Yeah, um, well, you can just put your private key in in something that has dual access or or, or voting access as as a, as an application on a, on an existing network. Right. Um, so the Bitcoin community is is known for staunchly defending Bitcoin's principles. Um, some sometimes it can be rude and aggressive, but I, but I think what what it stems from is just a um, a desire to not have um, 
wealthy or powerful people or institutions uh, negatively impacting Bitcoin or or sort of changing the rules in favor of, of them. I'm curious to hear from each of you what role you feel like you and your your own institutions, your own companies, um, what role can you play in Bitcoin and how do you how do you positively impact it without having these negative drawbacks? Um, Kathy, maybe start with you. Sure. Uh, yes. Well, ARC um, has uh, stood for two things, democratization and transparency. Uh, democratize it. We're the closest you'll find to a venture capital fund in the public equity markets. And I kind of feel that uh, Bit, I mean, Bitcoin, or we have uh, uh, Bitcoin's DNA from that point of view. Uh, so uh, what one of the things in terms of democratization is education. We uh, have um, one of our, our missions, values, is to educate. And I do believe that um, that some of Yassine Almandra's white papers, Yassine's our lead crypto analyst, uh, who's worked very closely with you, Steve, on, on this conference, um, are are helping helping the cause. We've done uh, and not only for retail investors. Uh, we found that uh, we had to do a bit more when it came to institutional investors, uh, just because of the way that they invest and uh, you know the way they they like to receive information. So. Um, uh, just like in our investments, we've been uh, uh, the retail community has been more attracted to us first, and now the institutional community is is coming along. So I, I do think our transparency of research, especially in uh, the social world, social media, pushing our research out uh, to uh, for free to anyone, uh, is is part of our our way of of helping the community. And I do think encouraging, and this is something uh, that Jack just said, um, uh, in, in, uh, I would encourage the support of the Bitcoin uh, core developer community. As I said uh, before, it's, it's amazing to me, having gotten to know some of them, uh, you know, how strong their sense of purpose is here. And uh, so we'd like to be a help of making uh, helpful in making that happen as well. That's great, um, Jack. How about you? How, how do you view your own personal role and in the companies you run? I, I think my my own personal role through the companies I run is um, to really push for more decentralization. Like at everything that we intend to do with the wallet um, being non custodial. Um, building a developer platform, focusing on non-custodial solutions. Uh, on the Square side is important, um, being completely open uh, development and open source. But I also think it's important on the Twitter side as well. Um, my biggest focus right now is on a decentralized social media protocol. Um, we're calling it Blue Sky. It's super, super early. But we've learned a lot from what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin and, and why that's important. I've learned a lot in that sense as well. and. Um, I think you know just continuing to to push on that thread and and show it with our actions every single day uh in support of of this community that's that's taught me so much and i think will benefit so many people and that, that's what i'm focused on what, what, what about letting uh uh twitter um advertisers pay in, in crypto yeah i mean um I think enabling anyone, I mean, it, as you know, Elon, like um, if if we had Bitcoin or native currency for the Internet before Twitter started, like it just creates so many different business models that we wouldn't have to be so dependent upon advertising generally. And sure. I, 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 I do believe that, you know, that we have them any form of payment uh, that um, they want to use, we should be able to take. So okay. absolutely. But. I'm more, I'm more focused on like, how do we create economic incentives in the network itself without having to rely on advertising? Yeah, it's just that the, the, the money has to come off of the, or the, 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 I mean, the crypto so-called coins, the hash strings have to come off the, and, and get translated into real products and services. So the more uh, sort of off ramps there are to real products, products and services, even at the institutional level, although I mean, there are certainly many small advertisers on, on Twitter, 
Um, it seems like like accepting Bitcoin, maybe maybe some other cryptos uh, for uh, advertising payments on on Twitter uh, would be supportive of of, of Bitcoin. Hundred percent, and also looking at just general commerce um, sure. through yeah. through Twitter itself. That was okay. <laughs> Sorry, what, Elon? I was asking Jack if he's going to do it. Oh. <laughs> no, gonna, 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 Can we get a product it. announcement today? <laughs> 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 um, Elon, how about you? Um, you know, you, you obviously you're a big personality on Twitter. Um, what are your thoughts on your your role and your comp company's role in um, in Bitcoin and sort of preserving the ethos? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I generally think uh, we should do things that uh, benefit the people as a whole and uh, increase the probability that the future is good. So, you know, I think it's, it, to me, it just seems self-evident that we should kind of um, take these set of actions most likely to make the future good. Um, and I think probably, um, probably, uh, you know, crypto or, you know, these some of the cryptocurrencies uh, will make the future better, most likely. It's, it's not, you know, the, I always think of these things in terms of probabilities, um, but I think it's, it's probably better for uh, there, there to be a prosperous Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, maybe some others in the future. Um, and uh, and I think it, it can have uh, an empowering effect uh, on for, for individuals. Um, and um, increase the power of the individual relative to government and really you know if you think of government gov government is just a corporation in the limit so sometimes some people are like uh, against corporations but for government it's like guys government is just a corporation in the limit it's the biggest corporation of all and it's got a monopoly on violence so if you don't like corporations you should really hate government There you go. All right, let's. We got about. Um, we'll we'll try to wrap up in ten minutes. So let's move on to future of Bitcoin. Um, so Tesla and Square have both put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Uh, Kathy, I'm curious to hear from you. What advice would you have for other institutions looking to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? Well, I guess the first uh, piece of advice is uh, you know just make sure. Uh, and I actually learned this after. Um, uh, after both Square and Tesla put Bitcoin on their balance sheet, you know, the, the Bitcoin is being treated as an intangible asset. And so we ne need to get FASB to reconsider this because with an intangible asset, if the asset goes up in price, it can't be marked up on their books. But if it goes down, it must be marked down. So, uh, you know, there's some asymmetry there, which is, uh, you know, we, we need to change that given, given what we believe um, uh, Bitcoin is. Um, and I do believe if, uh, I, I'll harken back to something, well, it was either Elon or Jack said, um, you know, think about it, uh, you know, you, you take away the boundaries, the different currencies, just think about how explosive growth could be and how wide reaching taking the friction out of the system could be. So uh, I would encourage um, corporations to think about that, that this um, uh, ability to do business anywhere in the world, ultimately, uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, paving the way here. Uh, that's certainly a consideration. It also will serve as a hedge against uh, inflation, uh, especially, and as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of emerging markets that are suffering from uh, significant inflation. In other words, the, the purchasing power of those populations is, uh, is going down. So they are going to migrate to, to Bitcoin and other ways to preserve purchasing power. Uh, and again, uh, being able to sell to them in that kind of currency would be very useful. I'd also uh, suggest once again, this idea of deflation, I think is going to be a real thing. Uh, there's going to be good deflation caused by innovation. So demand will boom because of that. There's going to be bad deflation because so many companies out there have not been enough, investing enough in innovation. Their products are going to go ob obsolete as you know and they're going to be stuck trying to service the debt uh, that they piled on uh, because their their shareholders wanted profits and wanted them now you know so they 
leveraged up to buy back their shares and pay dividends and they so so i think that's going to be the source of bad deflation and counterparty risk uh and we learned from 0809 that counterparty risk can be devastating uh mm -hmm. almost cataclysmic so a hedge against that as well i think uh would be another reason to do it Great. yeah it's, it's funny like, like I, it kind of like t tesla's bank balances in europe have negative interest rate it drives me yeah. crazy yeah. Uh, i mean t technically if you if you've got like two percent inflation Welcome everybody to The B Word. I'm Steve Lee, the lead of Square Crypto, and I'm here today to moderate a discussion about Bitcoin that will span from what makes it special to the um, its relationship with energy, it, the community ethos, and the future of Bitcoin. I'm joined by three special guests. The first is Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, and CIO of ARK Invest. Next is Elon Musk, Techno King of Tesla and Chief Engineer of SpaceX. <laughs> and finally, uh, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square and CEO of Twitter. So we have a lot to talk about today. So let's get to the talk and get right to it. Um, I'm going to start off by asking each of you uh, a question, uh, which is what um, what's shaped and influenced your views on Bitcoin? And let's start with Kathy. Okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, well, the first thing was uh, our focus on disruptive innovation. Uh, so starting in 2011, Brett Winton, our director of research, who I know will be on the program later, um, he started talking about this thing called crypto, well, Bitcoin at the time. And it was a curiosity as we were doing our brainstorms in, in research. But as we learned more about this open source ecosystem, uh, that might fulfill the role of the, the payment system that the internet neglected to build into the system, not expecting commerce. We thought, hmm, this might be something. And then I became even more interested when I realized uh, that, there, that, that my economics would come into play as well here. And uh, Art Laffer, um, my mentor uh, from, from USC, uh, and a monetary scholar, uh, in 2014, I asked him if he would collaborate on a paper on on Bitcoin. Uh, and he he was a bit of a naysayer at first, and uh, but agreed to read the paper. He read the paper, tore it up, uh, and 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 from an economics point of view, really wanted to understand this. And he said, "You know, I think you got something here. This is a rules based monetary system." I've been waiting for this for my entire career. So the combination of disruptive innovation generally, economics on top of that, and the huge misunderstanding out there as to what this is, uh, that was that was intriguing and, and launched our research effort. Thank you. Elon, uh, what's influenced your views on Bitcoin? Well, I've th thought about money for quite a while, obviously since the PayPal days. Um, the uh, uh, and then the, the companies that preceded that X.com, which I created, and and uh, Confinity, which uh, Peter Thiel, Max Levchin, uh, Luke Howery, and others created. Um, and we combined the companies and made PayPal. Made PayPal. So I've been thinking about money for a long time. Um, and r really, it's it, it's, like, it's best to think of money as an information system, uh, primarily an information system for labor allocation. Um, and uh, for practical purposes, it exists in a series of uh, heterogeneous databases, like very different databases in uh, bank mainframes around the world. Uh, it uh, moves quite slowly in reality. It may seem to move fast sometimes, and it does with PayPal, which is real time. But uh, the vast majority of the systems out there are batch processing. So the actual uh, reconciliation may take uh, one to five uh, business days, uh, so sometimes longer. Um, and the, you have the ACH system, which is ancient and still still in operation, which is um, allows transfers uh, effectively like a, a check would be an ACH tra transfer, but it's it's not secure. And you've got the uh, credit card systems, which are also uh, not secure. It would be like handing your username and password to a stranger in a restaurant if, if you buy a meal. So um, 
there's, there's definitely an opportunity for uh, something that is uh, that is better from an inf information theory standpoint. So, um, and, and 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 there you can think of it like data data on a network. I think is, is the way to view it. Um, what has the the most throughput? What has uh, the the least error? Uh, lost? What what drops the fewest packets? Uh, fraud, fraud, for example, being a source of error, um, and uh, uh, government interference in currencies being a source of error. Um, but it's it's fundamentally an information system. So. Um, I think it makes sense to support something that uh, improves the, the 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 quality of information with which we conduct the economy, um, and you know, Bitcoin is uh, a candidate for that. Uh, it is it does I think some things well, um, and it's obviously it's, it's evolving, and there are additional things like Lightning being done on top of Bitcoin, um, but but Bitcoin per se is mostly solving for uh, scarcity. Um, or, or rather, solving for uh, essentially um, having no throat to choke, decentralized. Uh, so there's there's no one who can be uh, coerced in any way uh, to uh, empty their Bitcoin account. Well, I guess they could technically buy it on an individual basis, but the system as a whole cannot. Um, and um, and it has an open ledger, uh, which is also quite quite good. Um, and if so, then Tesla will resume Bitcoin, uh, accepting Bitcoin. Uh, yeah. So I think we want to do just do a little bit more diligence. And, and I think, but most likely the answer is that Tesla would, would resume accepting Bitcoin. Most, most likely. That's Steve, great to hear. I would Steve, agree with that. Kathy? Yeah, may I ask a question? Um, Elon, I'm not quite sure if you saw the paper uh, that Square and ARC did together on um, making uh, Bitcoin mining a part of a utility, uh, you know, a broad-based utility ecosystem, whereby, you know, the overage from sunshine or wind uh, uh, powers the Bitcoin mining machine, thereby uh, enabling uh, the proliferation of renewables uh, to a much faster extent or at a faster rate than otherwise would be the case. What do you think of that? Well, the problem is that um, in order to operate um, so-called uh, mining or hashing rigs, uh, in order to op operate a bunch of hashing rigs, uh, uh, you eff effectively you have to run them twenty-four-seven, um, which means you need base load. Uh, you can do that with uh, solar and wind plus battery, but if you only did it based on solar wind overage, uh, your um, your your hashing regularization would be much less. So you'd be at a disadvantage. Sure, uh, it'd be a disadvantage. Hydro, or geothermal, hydro or geothermal are great for mm -hmm. as renewable means. I'm also uh, pro pro nuclear. Uh, I think modern nuclear power plants are safe, uh, contrary to what people may think. Um, so, um, I really think we, you know, we, um, it's, it's possible to make an, an, very, very extremely safe <laughs> nuclear. I'm talking about fission. You don't need fusion. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, fusion, you just got that big fusion reactor in the sky called the sun it comes up every, you know, every day. Um, so, uh, but I think a combination of solar and wind plus uh, stationary storage uh, will get you that uh, base load so you can run uh, uh, hashing 24-7. I'm, Jack, I'm curious, you, you've stated that Bitcoin incentivizes renewable energy uh, as what we're talking about now. Do you have any additional thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, every everything that uh, that Elon said and Kathy Kathy mentioned, but um, it it's also incentivizing a lot of innovation in in just energy space and just like looking at unused energy. Um, there's a there's a company called uh, Great American Mining that um, caps the methane flares on oil oil fields to power their their rigs and. You just imagine, and, and you mentioned nuclear Elon as well, and just imagine all the unused energy that is just being wasted every single day. Um, and being able to get that energy and convert it, converting it into a secure, sound money system for the planet um, feels like a worthy trade-off. And, and that's the sort of incentive that I think is, is most powerful is like, how do we reuse what is being currently just dumped on the ground and wasted and and not considered, and how do we do that at scale? Um, and I think that's a, that's a bigger conversation that I think is 
is missing. Um, but I agree with, with everything that, that Elon has said and also, um, you know, the paper we put forth. I, I'm curious if any of you have thoughts on how the industry, could, what the industry can do to accelerate this the transition to renewable energy. And like Elon specifically, could Tesla Energy or Starlink play a role? Well, um, I think Tesla can play a role. Or t t I mean, Tesla's um, uh, literal like reason for existence. Um, I mean, the reason I've, I've I've put so much of my life energy into Tesla, which is a lot. Um, in fact, it's, I would say that I've had some 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 pretty tough life experiences, and Tesla is responsible for probably two thirds of all all personal and professional pain combined. Just to give you a sense of perspective there. Um, so this is a hella hard situation, um, but we, we, we do solar, uh, commercial solar, um, solar retrofit as well as the solar um, roof. Um, and we make uh, consumer um, battery packs called Powerwall for houses and small businesses. And then the utility scale, uh, which, which are gigantic, these we, we've done now uh, a number of, of gigawatt hour installations. Like a, a, that's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> Um, and, and a lot of them actually have been for load leveling the grid. M mostly they are, um, and, and combined with like big, so like the one, the first really big one we did, which is, um, a hundred megawatt installation in, um, in Australia, uh, uh, that's actually helped stabilize a huge portion of the South Australian grid, um, because it's able to react so fast. Um, in fact, at first, um, <laughs> they, they've, they've got the, a billing system in, in Australia that I think works at the sort of millisecond level and we were operating at the microsecond level. <laughs> so it was, it was, the system was operating so fast that, that the measuring system couldn't see it. But um, so, so Tesla certainly doing, doing a lot to um, uh, enable renewables, uh, especially wind and solar. Um, uh, and in fact, the limiting factor for us right now is cell production. So we, we need to uh, both internally uh, get our, the Tesla internal, internal battery cells produced, as well as uh, increased supply from suppliers. Um, I mean, generally, when I talk to our suppliers, they say, what, what, how many cells would you like us? Like, how many cells can you make? Um, you know, because sometimes they're like concerned, like, was well, Tesla going to compete with them on cells? I'm like, no, no, if you want to make the cells, be our guest. It's just that we, we need a crazy number of, of batteries. Um, and they need to be done, it obviously needs to be mined and produced and um, manufactured um, in an ethical and environmentally sound way. So, um, you know, at Tesla, we, we really do aspire to be the good guys, like, you know, to be, to be a company that, that people can, can believe in. That doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but that's what we try. So, um, yeah, but I think generally um, a hydro, especially existing hydro is, is good for uh, mining. Uh, geothermal, there's lots of places in the world that have geothermal energy. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, nuclear is also good. Um, so, um, yeah, I think just, 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 I'm like, I'm, I'm, and I'm like, as I said earlier, I'm like, <laughs> the expectation is not like that the, the, the energy production must be pure as the driven snow, but it, it, it must, uh, it, it can't be using, it also cannot be using the, the world's dirtiest coal, which was for a moment there. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's just difficult to, for Tesla to support in that situation. So I, I think, um, and I, but I do think long-term renewable energy will actually be the cheapest form of energy. It just takes, it just doesn't happen overnight. Um, but as long as that there, as long as there is a, a conscious and, and, and determined and real effort by the mining community to move towards renewables, then obviously Tesla can support that. That's great. Um, Kathy, we've been talking a lot about energy, but many institutions are facing questions around Bitcoin's relationship with ESG. Um, can you maybe speak a little bit more to what, what is S and G in ESG and, and how Bitcoin might support those? Sure. So E, of course, is environmental, S is social, and G is governance. Uh, and there is a massive movement uh, afoot in the institutional world, especially, uh, to embrace uh, ESG and, and make sure that their asset managers are, are doing the same. 
so if if you th we've just talked about environmental, and I I really do believe uh, that Bitcoin will be uh, much more environmentally friendly, certainly than traditional gold mining or the traditional financial services sector. In many ways, it already is, uh, and it's just going to uh, get better that way. In terms of social, I know that. Um, Many institutions, when they are thinking of social, they think of diversity and equity, pay equity, and all of that. Uh, but uh, if, if uh, from our point of view, the disruptive innovation point of view, social is uh, much more than that. Uh, it is saving lives, of course, autonomous technology, that would be another topic uh, for, for Elon. Uh, but in this case, uh, allowing access to payment technology, as Jack is, is saying, everywhere around the world without friction. If you, and just back to the remittance um, example, I think uh, if, if I've got these stats correctly, you know, there are certain countries in the world that are dependent, incredibly dependent on remittances for, you know, GDP. Uh, to uh, Tonga, 37%, El Salvador, which just deemed uh, Bitcoin legal currencies, 24%, Nepal, 24%. And I think the remittance industry globally <clears throat> is uh, roughly 700 billion. Uh, so uh, saving people these uh, egregious fees, you know, think about it, you're paying anywhere from 8% to, to, as Jack said, 30% of your $100 that you're sending back to your family. Uh, that is a social responsibility, I, I would submit, as is just the uh, economic empowerment that Bitcoin will enable. We've talked about that already. Uh, and I know that uh, Alex Gladstein is going to be talking later about, um, you know, the 4.3 billion people in the world who are hostage to authoritarian regimes or the 1.3 billion who are living in a uh, uh, double digit and, and triple digit inflation, if not more, um, saving them from the destruction of their purchasing power certainly is uh, a noble social goal. So we expand social to be m much more than uh, the traditional ESG community. And then on governance, you've got uh, the transparency of the ecosystem. Uh, you know, uh, it's completely transparent, unlike uh, the opaqueness of financial systems and the toll takers in uh, the traditional financial world. And I think a huge part, a part of governance in the Bitcoin ecosystem is the are the uh, Bitcoin core developers. Now, uh, before I met them, and I've had the pleasure and the honor of of meeting uh, uh, many of them. Uh, you know, that was that was a part of this ecosystem I didn't understand. But actually getting to sit down and talk to them, uh, I, uh, if I, if I uh, have a learning curve need, it certainly is on the technology side. But in, in terms of talking to them about economics, economic theory, failed monetary regimes uh, historically, they know economic history, many of them, better than anyone I've ever met. Uh, so that gives me a great degree of confidence that, uh, you know, they they do believe they, they are on a noble mission. They could be paid a lot more than they're being paid right now if they worked at Google or, or Facebook or, or some of these other areas. But they've chosen, uh, you know, um, this sense of purpose for a noble goal. And uh, they have incredibly strong technology backgrounds. Uh, so, uh, as well as a good understanding of economic history, especially monetary uh, history, uh, and it gives me a, a great deal of comfort as I think about the governance of the ecosystem, uh, much much more so than I, I think we would find in other financial ecosystems. Uh, and just to give you an example of that, I think two years, we were talking about that apparently, I mean, not apparently, uh, there's a big debate about reorganizations. I know in the Ethereum network right now, well, we uh, saw the, the core Bitcoin developers and others at work uh, back in 2019 when Binance tried to reorganize uh, in order to uh, reclaim 7,000 uh, Bitcoin that were hacked. 
and they just wouldn't allow it. So we've already had some very good tests of the Bitcoin ecosystem, including developers. Uh, so that would great. be my answer. See. Thank, thank you. Uh, and it's a great transition to the next topic area, which is Bitcoin ethos. And what is Bitcoin ethos? I mean, Bitcoin was born as open source and it's very transparent. Um, there's also a, a staunch defense from the community around decentralization and a lot of the core principles of Bitcoin. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that and what makes it special. Jack, um, Square has done a lot to support open source Bitcoin. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what Square has done and what advice you'd have for other institutions looking to follow in its footsteps? Yeah, I mean, I was I was very skeptical of corporations when I was a kid, and I'm still skeptical of corporations today. And, you know, as we've used corporations to be, you know, they, they've been great great vessels for what we need to do and the ideas that we need to bring to the world. But, um, you know, Bitcoin is not that. And um, when we were considering Bitcoin and how Square intersected, I was really concerned with um, how we don't disrupt the community in a negative way, how we promote what is amazing about it and how we help it grow in that way, in the way that it wants to. So we created your team, Steve, which is Square Crypto, which is hiring open source developers to work on whatever they want and whatever they think is most important to, to help Bitcoin. Um, we created an organization called Copo, which we gave up all of our crypto patents um, so that the community can use them uh, in defense against uh, trolls and um, some, uh, some, some crazy characters we won't name. And um, we continue to find ways that like, following that Bitcoin path, we're, we're going to create a hardware wallet. We're probably going to do a lot more in hardware. Um, everything that we do in the space is going to be completely open source from the hardware design um, to the, the software, um, taking in the community's uh, push. And we're, we're building a, a developer platform as well in the same open development, open source, um, and uh, uh, completely transparent. So I think as institutions or companies like ours consider getting in the space, um, I think contribution back to the community is important. Tessa did this um, with uh, accepting payments for Tessa and finding security holes and uh, improving the stack. And uh, as I said before, we can't just see this as an asset that we own and, and an investment vehicle. Um, this is something that has the potential to change everything and make the lives of everyone on this planet better in some small, maybe marginal way, but um, th those, margin those margins will be meaningful as they compound over time. Great. Uh, Elon, you've tweeted before that any wallet that doesn't give the user their private key should be avoided at all costs. Um, can you tell us more about what, why is that important and, and you know, how does it what does its relationship with decentralization? Well, <clears throat> it's difficult to say that if, if you uh, own crypto in an exchange and that exchange does not give you your private keys, it's not clear that you own anything. I mean, if, if, if there's something that, if that exchange breaks or is hacked or, uh, you know, um, or, or is subject to seizure by the government or something like that, uh, you, you don't, your, your crypto is gone. Um, so in order to actually have a properly decentralized finance, you, uh, which I'm a fan of, um, I think it makes sense, uh, then you, you, you have to own your, your private keys. Um, and you should be the only one who has your private keys. <laughs> so if you're the only one who has the private keys, then then you own it. <laughs> um, if you if someone else has your private keys, effectively they own it too. Um, and your your the security of your crypto is then dependent upon them or any entity that can affect uh, them. So uh, yeah, um, I I think what Jack's doing sounds, sounds like a good idea to have um, you know a hardware wallet that uh, that's. The, the, that's the only thing that contains your private keys. Um, like the, that's like it, in, in, in terms of sort of empowering the people, which I very much, very much believe in, then I, I think you want to have people have the, the, their own wallets and, uh, and be the only ones that, ca that, uh, that have the private keys to that, that wallet. So so-called wallet, <laughs> the other side of the, <laughs> of the crypto. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> 
I, I think we'll see an emergence too of new solutions that um, use multi-sig, uh, like like with a two of three keys, where the the user has two keys and then you you get assisted custody by having an institution hold hold a third key can be a good good solution as well. Yeah. Um, well, you can just put your private key in in something that has dual access or or, or voting access as as a, as an application on a, on an existing network. Right. Um, so the Bitcoin community is is known for staunchly defending Bitcoin's principles. Um, some sometimes it can be rude and aggressive, but I but I think what what it stems from is just a um, a desire to not have um, wealthy or powerful people or institutions. Uh, negatively impacting Bitcoin or or sort of changing the rules in favor of, of them. I'm curious to hear from each of you what role you feel like you and your your own institutions, your own companies, um, what role can you play in Bitcoin and how do you how do you positively impact it without having these negative drawbacks? Um, Kathy, maybe start with you. Sure. Uh, yes. Well, ARC um, has uh, stood for two things, democratization and transparency. Uh, democratize. We're the closest you'll find to a venture capital fund in the public equity markets. And I kind of feel that... Uh, Bit, I mean, that Bitcoin, or we have uh, uh, Bitcoin's DNA from that point of view. Uh, so, uh, what one of the things in terms of democratization is education. We uh, have um, one of our, our missions, values, is to educate, and I do believe that um, that some of Yassine Almandra's white papers. Yassine's our lead crypto analyst, uh, who's worked very closely with you, Steve, on on this conference. Um, are are helping helping the cause. We've done uh, and not only for retail investors. Uh, we found that uh, we had to do a bit more when it came to institutional investors, uh, just because of the way that they invest and uh, you know the way they they like to receive information. So. Um, uh, just like in our investments, we've been uh, uh, the retail community has been more attracted to us first, and now the institutional community is is coming along. So I, I do think our transparency of research, especially in uh, the social world, social media, pushing our research out uh, to uh, for free to anyone, uh, is is part of our our way of of helping the community. And I do think encouraging, and this is something uh, that Jack just said, um, uh, in, in, uh, I would encourage the support of the Bitcoin uh, core developer community. As I said uh, before, it's it's amazing to me, having gotten to know some of them, uh, you know, how strong their sense of purpose is here. And uh, so we'd like to be a help of making uh, helpful in making that happen as well. That's great, um, Jack. How about you? How, how do you view your own personal role and in the companies you run? I, I think my my own personal role through the companies I run is um, to really push for more decentralization. Like at everything that we intend to do with the wallet um, being non custodial. Um, building a developer platform, focusing on non-custodial solutions. Uh, on the Square side is important, um, being completely open uh, development and open source. But I also think it's important on the Twitter side as well. Um, my biggest focus right now is on a decentralized social media protocol. Um, we're calling it Blue Sky. It's super, super early. But we've learned a lot from what makes Bitcoin Bitcoin and, and why that's important. I've learned a lot in that sense as well. and. Um, I think you know just continuing to to push on that thread and and show it with our actions every single day uh in support of of this community that's that's taught me so much and i think will benefit so many people and um, that, that's what i'm focused on what, what, what about letting uh uh twitter um advertisers pay in, in crypto yeah i mean um I think enabling anyone, I mean, it, as you know, Elon, like um, if if we had Bitcoin or native currency for the internet before Twitter started, like it just creates so many different business models that we wouldn't have to be so dependent upon advertising generally. And 
sure. I, 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 I do believe that, you know, that we have them, any form of payment uh, that um, they want to use, we should be able to take. So okay. absolutely. But I'm more, I'm more focused on like, how do we create economic incentives in the network itself without having to rely on advertising? Yeah, it's just that the, the, the money has to come off of the, or the, 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 I mean, the crypto so-called coins, the hash strings have to come off the and, and get translated into real products and services. So the more uh, sort of off ramps there are to real products, products and services, even at the institutional level, although I mean, there are certainly many small advertisers on, on Twitter, um, it seems like, like accepting Bitcoin, maybe, maybe some other cryptos uh, for uh, advertising payments on, on Twitter uh, would be supportive of, of, of Bitcoin. 100%. And also looking at just general commerce. Um, through yeah. through Twitter itself. That was <laughs> Sorry, what, Elon? I was asking Jack if he's going to do it. Can we get a product announcement today? <laughs> <laughs> um, Elon, how about you? Um, you know, you you obviously you're a big personality on Twitter. Um, what are your thoughts on your your role and your comp company's role in? Um, and Bitcoin and sort of preserving the ethos. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I generally think uh, we should do things that uh, benefit the people as a whole and uh, increase the probability that the future is good. So, you know, I think it's, it, to me, it just seems self-evident that we should kind of um, take these set of actions most likely to make the future good. Um, and I think probably, um, Probably, uh, you know, crypto or, you know, at least some of the cryptocurrencies uh, will make the future better, most likely. It's, it's not, you know, the, I always think of these things in terms of probabilities, um, but I think it's, it's probably better for uh, there, there to be a prosperous Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, maybe some others in the future. Um, and uh, and I think it, it can have uh, an empowering effect uh, on for, for individuals um, and um, increase the power of the individual relative to government. And it really, you know, if you think of government, gov government is just a corporation in the limit. So sometimes some people are like uh, against corporations, but for government, it's like, guys, government is just a corporation in the limit. It's the biggest corporation of all. And it's got a monopoly on violence. So if you don't like corporations, you should really hate government. <laughs> there you go. All right. Let's, we got about, um, we'll, we'll try to wrap up in 10 minutes. So let's move on to future of Bitcoin. Um, so Tesla and Square have both put Bitcoin on the balance sheet. Uh, Kathy, I'm curious to hear from you. What advice would you have for other institutions looking to put Bitcoin on their balance sheet? Well, I guess the first uh, piece of advice is, uh, you know, just make sure. Uh, and I actually learned this after um, uh, after both Square and Tesla put Bitcoin on their balance sheet. You know, the, the Bitcoin is being treated as an intangible asset. And so we ne need to get FASB to reconsider this because with an intangible asset, if the asset goes up in price, it can't be marked up on their books, but if it goes down, it must be marked down. So, uh, you know, there's some asymmetry there, which is, uh, you know, we, we need to change that given, given what we believe um, uh, Bitcoin is. Um, and I do believe if, uh, I, I'll harken back to something, well, it was either Elon or Jack said, um, you know, think about it, uh, you know, you you take away the boundaries, the different currencies, just think about how explosive growth could be and how wide reaching taking the friction out of the system could be. So uh, I would encourage um, corporations to think about that, that this um, uh, ability to do business anywhere in the world, ultimately, uh, obviously, you know, we're, we're uh, you know, paving the way here. Uh, that's certainly a consideration. It also will serve as a hedge against uh, inflation, uh, especially, in, as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of emerging markets that are suffering from uh, significant inflation. In other words, the, the purchasing power of those populations is, uh, is going down. So they are going to migrate to 
to Bitcoin and other ways to preserve purchasing power. Uh, and again, uh, being able to sell to them in that kind of currency would be very useful. I'd also uh, suggest once again, this idea of deflation, I think is going to be a real thing. Uh, there's going to be good deflation caused by innovation. So demand will boom because of that. There's going to be bad deflation because so many companies out there have not been enough, investing enough in innovation. Their products are going to go ob obsolete as, you know, and they're going to be stuck trying to service the debt uh, that they piled on uh, because their their shareholders wanted profits and wanted them now, you know, so they leveraged up to buy back their shares and pay dividends and they so so i think that's going to be the source of bad deflation and counterparty risk uh and we learned from 0809 that counterparty risk can be devastating uh mm -hmm. and almost cataclysmic so a hedge against that as well i think uh would be another reason to do it Great. Yeah, it's funny. Like, like I, it kind of like t tesla's bank balances in europe have negative interest rates it drives me crazy. Yeah. I mean, t technically, if you if you've got like two percent inflation and one percent interest, you're technically minus one percent uh, return. Uh, but nonetheless, it is just it is quite annoying to just see your bank ba bank balance drop in real time in Europe. It's Europe has negative interest rates. This is insane. Yeah. Paying the banks, <laughs> what? Paying the banks to hold the bank to keep yeah. your money. <laughs> I'm like, what? It is crazy. Like, what, we should definitely move that into Bitcoin. <laughs> I, I believe Ray Dalio said, uh, buy Bitcoin and not bonds. So there, yeah. there you go. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Jack, you've talked about design being an underfunded area in, in Bitcoin. Uh, and, and Elon earlier mentioned, you know, usability could improve a lot. I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Um, what do you see as the future of how can design impact Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I think that the Bitcoin network is is beautifully designed as a protocol in, in the way it works. I mean, it, it went after a single problem and it, it does in an absolutely um, astounding way. But I, I think the, the, the end points of people getting into it is still a little bit confusing. So I think the more energy we spend on, on wallets um, and making sure that the wallets are simple and um, accessible and they're non-custodial uh, as well. Um, I, I think the best the best example of this is that I know of is probably this wallet called Moon, um, and it's just simple, straightforward. It's a great it it, it does an amazing thing with uh, key management um, that you know my mom and friends new to Bitcoin can understand. Uh, does amazing in storage, and it also has a very clever implementation of Lightning, so that you can use it in a transactional way without having to think about it. Um, just with QR codes in, in a way that makes sense. So more work like that, I think, really brings us forward. Great. Um, let's wrap things up with a final question for each of you. Um, I guess, what what is your hope for Bitcoin? Um, what it, How it can impact the world? Um, let's see. Elon, do you want to do you want to start with that? So what's your hope? What's your hope for Bitcoin? Um, well, my, my hope for um, I guess crypto in general uh, is that it can improve the efficiency of the information system that we call money. Um, so if, if the core efficiency of money is improved and the um, and money has less error, where like I said, er error is like in any kind of government interference or fraud or anything like that, uh, this will na naturally lead to uh, uh, basically a better standard of living and more power to the to the individual, which I very much agree with. Great. Kathy? Yeah, and I would I would um, segue uh, from what um, Elon just said is, you know, m money has powerful network effect uh, uh, qualities. And uh, so, you know, we talked about ESG earlier. I think that, uh, uh, of course, that aspiration having you know the uh this money be the best from an ESG point of view that's that's really talking about 
solving some of the world's problems right now, which we definitely want to do. But I also am very excited about this idea of network effect and the convergence of blockchain technology and artificial intelligence um, from a, a, a technology point of view. Uh, I think, you know, we, think about the internet in the earliest days. We couldn't imagine what was going to happen, but the but the impetus to growth uh, was, was pretty incredible. So I am looking at, uh, you know, the, this rules-based monetary policy, you know, making uh, for better lives around the world, as we've just said, but I'm also looking at the technology itself and the convergence between blockchain technology and artificial intelligence, uh, you know, to, to uh, change the world in ways that we cannot imagine right now, solving even more problems, but creating more opportunities as well, which is the history of technology and disruptive innovation. Jack, what's your hope for Bitcoin? Uh, my hope is that it creates world peace or helps create world peace. I mean, Elon, Elon said it earlier, like it, we, we have all these monopolies of violence and the individual doesn't have power. And the amount of cost and distraction that comes from our monetary system today is real. And it takes away attention from the bigger problems. Some of the, some of the bigger problems that Elon is trying to solve, like get us to a multi-planetary humanity. All these distractions that we have to deal with on a daily basis take away from those bigger goals that affect every single person on this planet increasingly so so i it it, it may sound a little bit ridiculous but like you, you fix that foundational level and everything above it improves uh in such a dramatic way so i it's it's gonna be long term but but my hope is my hope is definitely peace that's fantastic well i'd like to thank all three of you for um giving us your time today it's been fantastic conversation Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, the B word is uh, not just this uh, discussion, but we have a lineup of incredible speakers and content. So I encourage everyone to check it out. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Thank you all. Welcome everybody to The B Word. I'm Steve Lee, the lead of Square Crypto, and I'm here today to moderate a discussion about Bitcoin that will span from what makes it special to the um, its relationship with energy, it, the community ethos, and the future of Bitcoin. I'm joined by three special guests. The first is Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, and CIO of ARK Invest. Next is Elon Musk, Techno King of Tesla and Chief Engineer of SpaceX. <laughs> and finally, uh, Jack Dorsey, CEO of Square and CEO of Twitter. So we have a lot to talk about today. So let's get to the talk and get right to it. Um, I'm going to start off by asking each of you uh, a question, uh, which is what um, what's shaped and influenced your views on Bitcoin? And let's start with Kathy. Okay, Steve, thank you. Uh, well, the first thing was uh, our focus on disruptive innovation. Uh, so starting in 2011, Brett Winton, our director of research, who I know will be on the program later, um, he started talking about this thing called crypto, well, Bitcoin at the time. And it was a curiosity as we were doing our brainstorms in, in research. But as we learn more about this open source ecosystem, uh, that might fulfill the role of the, the payment system that, 